Okay, so um, as some of you may notice, I am not Simon Hetrick, who is supposed to be uh, chairing this. Um, Simon sends his apologies and uh, dumped me in it right at the last moment. So uh, we have assembled an amazing set of panelists. What I'm going to do is uh, get them to introduce themselves and in two minutes uh, each, uh, do a little bit of introduction about what they think about a particular topic that is close to uh, many of our hearts, which is how do we convince people to adopt software engineering practices? Uh, so they've had a little bit of time to mull over this, uh, but um, I'm quite sure that they're all going to give us uh, words of wisdom and insight that will not overlap, because they talk to each other, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm going to start at this end, work my way to the end, uh, and then after that we're going to open it to questions from the floor. Hi, uh, my name is Jess Parker. I work at the Science and Technology Facilities Council, where I uh, develop two codes that are used to study um, turbulence inside nuclear fusion reactors. Um, so what's interesting to me about the software I use is that I have two sets of communities that are doing very similar problems, and uh, in one community they have very good software practices, and in the other they um, have not quite so good practices, despite doing uh, very similar things. Um, I think before I get on my other course, I'm just going to introduce the, the, the uh, codes I use. So primarily, the people that develop these codes are the users. Um, and they are all physicists and mathematicians, so they are highly numerate, but have no training in computer science. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, these codes are sort of 10 to 20 years old. So um, when it comes to talking about how do we get good software sustainability practices, it's not you know, where do we start? For me, it's a kind of a modernization process. It's how do you get people going from uh, practices that were good 10 years ago to practices that are good now. Uh, so that's my introduction to my last one. <coughs> oh, yeah. um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Karina Haupt. I'm the head of the software engineering group at the German Aerospace Center. A huge organization working on different fields of um, <coughs> research, and um, like for you, it's uh, most of the people working there they don't have any training in software engineering. And um, when they when I talk to them about software engineering and say you should uh, adopt some of the methods and, and introduce tools, what I often hear is that um, it's so much effort, so, so you're overwhelmed of all the possibilities and all the things they could do. Because they always think they have directly to go for the holy grail of software engineering to have the perfect software engineering project. So I try to talk to them that it's about um, the little things which will help you on the right time. So often enough, it's not necessary to get everything but introduce the run right thing. Like um, if you have this software which is running and still in use, it might be enough to for first step to introduce an end-to-end -end test which will check if everything is still running perfectly and if there's a bug, you would just introduce something else. And um, so I did this in a further place I worked with and the first, when I talked about introducing testing, it was like, oh my God, this will take months. When I t explained that this one test would be enough, they were like, oh, we're done in hours. And I said, okay, it's somewhere in between. <laughs> but yeah, this is like the approach which I think is most important. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm Louise Brown. I'm a research software engineer at Nottingham. Um, I'm one of the first batch of EPSRC RSC fellows, and I work in the Composites Research Group in engineering. I'm a mechanical engineer by background, um, and I work on um, software for modelling textiles and textile composites. And one of the things that interests me is is the sort of difference in culture between what I see in sort of a lot of this community with a lot of scientists, natural scientists and whatever, and engineers. And um, it's not uncommon to, to go to a room full of researchers in engineering who are writing code, and none of them will have heard of version control. So in, in sort of from my perspective, it, it's sort of getting the word out there that this thing exists, and these sorts of techniques and practices exist, because 
often, once they've heard about something, they're quite willing to have a go and find out about it. So it's the difference between the sort of different domains that interests me. Thanks. Um, I'm Alice Brett and I work at Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy in Oxfordshire, which is the UK's national nuclear fusion research lab. So on the site there were two tokamak experiments and I'm head of the software engineering group and this is a team of mostly RSEs who are providing tools for the scientists to access and work with the JET data, so things like data access APIs and analysis and visualisation tools. So internally at UKAEA, um, we're running some initiatives to try and improve sort of software engineering practices more generally because there were probably about 200 people writing software in some form or another, um, most of them scientists and engineers, but a few other software engineering groups. And on top of that, sort of what my involvement in the national picture is that at the moment I'm joint chair of the UK RC Association. So I'm interested in the role of research software engineers as sort of people who can enable um, a wider adoption of software engineering practices in their institutes. So as well as directly by applying the practices themselves and being involved in writing the software themselves, their role as sort of collaborators with scientists and other researchers and um, in providing training and um, facilities for them to adopt the practices too. And internally, I think one thing that helps with getting people to uh, adopt uh, software engineering practices when you're trying to sort of do that <coughs> cultural change stuff is that you really have to kind of be quite strategic in where you focus your energy and, and what thing is going to make the most difference right now because it can just seem like an overwhelming task. So looking for what is that strategic next step that you really want people to adopt and really doing the just the, the on the ground work to help the people who might be borderline, you know, whether they're going to be able to adopt this or not, really really to give them the help when it counts. Okay, I'm Dan Katz uh, from the University of Illinois. Um, I'm the Assistant Director for Scientific Software and Applications uh, at NCSA there. And um, I've also been working on software citation for about the last three years or so, I would guess. Um, I think there, I guess, kind of following what Louise said and talking about different communities, I want to say a little bit about what we did with software citation and because I think it could be reused um, for, uh, for software engineering. And so what we did was to come up with some very, very high level basic principles that we thought could apply in a bunch of different areas. And what we're doing now then is trying to figure out how those principles are applied within specific communities. And, and even more so, the thing that I'm doing is trying to go to conferences that are domain conferences, um, such as in high energy physics and astronomy, um, work with people in those communities that are interested to create sessions where we talk about these issues and where we try to customize the guidance specifically for them. And so I think we could do the same thing for software engineering if we had sets of best practices that we thought were generally true then we could try to take those and customize them for particular uh, disciplines by working with people that really are the, uh, the, the, the driving people in those disciplines that are also working on software already. Right, I'm going to change over. So, you can all get this microphone. I can get this microphone. Uh, and I guess just to start off the, the discussion, um, one of the things that came up here was around kind of where you start trying to um, make this adoption hold and, and then kind of like take force. So, so here's the question. Um, you've mentioned about kind of trying to focus your efforts. What's the best way of doing that? Is this, is this by focusing on a particular type of uh, a group of people within a particular community or domain area? Is it uh, by sort of saying, I'm doing this in my own organization and going outwards? What, what are people's experiences of trying to focus their efforts? Um, well, I would say firstly that um, we're kind of dealing with quite a small group of people. So for me, I, I'm not sure there's too much to be gained from splitting people off and um, separating them. Uh, but typically, I think uh, PhD students and postdocs are kind of quite receptive. So the, there's, um, I think that's a, a good place to start. Yeah. So um, in our case, we have several thousand people who develop software at DNR. So it's just a lot. And 
So to start with um, process we offer, trainings, we prepare guidelines, similar to perhaps to what you have, and um, our approach is to first get the willing. So you always have these people who are keen on doing and they just don't know where to start, so we try to reach them, to get them into the boat, and uh, especially to present their success stories afterwards, because if people see that they have uh, that other groups have uh, made progress, have solved their problems, uh, others will come after and they will come to our um, trainings as well. So often it's like, we have one person who said, I wanna learn how this is done. And then in the next year we have the next people of the group because they were like, yeah, he's telling us about all this stuff now, I wanna hear it really, how it works and not just second hand. So um, this is working quite well for us. Um, but on the uh, same time, like you have the willing from below, you also have to address management that this is an important topic. So people will be allowed to go to the trains, will get the resources of it for that. If you don't do this, it will be a really unfair fight. And then both sides have to kind of try to meet in the middle somewhere. Yeah. <coughs> do you have similar experiences as, as part of kind of like bigger organizations, Alice and, and Dan? Uh. <laughs> Yes, I think broadly, broadly similar. So in order to sort of try and focus on what's the next challenge, we've tried to put together a sort of reasonably representative panel of people who already were quite keen from different areas of the organisation. So it wasn't sort of entirely the kind of IT services trying to tell others what to do. And um, so we identified a few things as sort of strategic next steps. And it, for us, it was sort of adoption of Git and GitLab as a, a platform on which you can then hook quite a lot of other good things afterwards. And I definitely second that um, there's a few different groups. There's the, the sort of people who are kind of broadly willing, but just concerned that they don't necessarily have the skills or the time. And that's where you need the kind of tactical assistance, people to just go in and help. And there's people who can potentially actually really help you. And sometimes it's, they often have strong opinions of their own as well. So if you can show that you're listening to them and that you're sometimes championing their ideas, then they will often help you with championing your ideas and spreading it around in their research group. And then there's the, the management and sort of people who can potentially control the purse strings and the resources. So <laughs> that's where we have to focus. And I guess I was going to say that I, I kind of feel like we need to be very entrepreneurial in how we do this. Um, and so if, if people haven't read the book uh, Crossing the Chasm, that's a, a nice one to read. Um, right, so this idea that there are some early adopters and that you need to really focus on them rather than trying to spread your effort across everybody. And, and get some of these initial successes that you can then use to, to grow up for the technical vision. Yeah. So the next question I would have is, what we always get asked is, why does the microphone um, close off? <laughs> uh, I, so the other question we get is, um, so you wanna, you wanna can, you, can you prove that uh, your practices are having an effect? So how do we measure uh, whether or not the things that we're talking about, the ways that we're trying to get people to adopt best practice, how do we measure whether they're being effective? One example that immediately springs to mind um, is one that happened in our research group um, last year. So a researcher left, his computer went into the computer graveyard in the office, um, which is a little cupboard, and then about three or four months later, um, somebody needed his code. So they went ferreting around trying to find his, lap, his desktop and found his hard drive. But if they'd been using some sort of version control or, or GitHub or, or something, if it had been left somewhere, then they could have saved themselves an awful lot of effort. Um, and that's the sort of thing that, that happens. Yeah. It is a definite. <laughs> I mean, I think so, it's the sort of thing that we all, we've all seen anecdotally happen. Yeah. In fact, it may even have happened to ourselves. Uh, but, but I guess um, the question goes on then, how do you know that if you had uh, taught that person to use uh, Git, GitLab um, at their institution, that that would have had an effect? Uh, so, so yeah, so, so we know that the way that they did it was the wrong way. So how do we know that the ways that you've described in, in improving the practice are the right way? <laughs> this is a much tougher panel than yesterday's. Right, so I, I don't think that I can give you an exact answer, but I, 
I guess the two things that come to mind are the um, the pre and post and uh, surveys that software truck injury does, and in particular the surveys that get done six months later, where they say, has this training made a difference in how you do your work? And they see people that clearly say yes. Uh, and then on the other side, I guess I would say that this is really, um, it's really an academic field in some sense of, right, of evaluation. And I think that there are people that are doing studies like this, but um, I, I don't think that I have any particular example of something that, that I've done where there has been a study of it that couldn't say that maybe. Um, so I don't think I have a specific answer also, but I think it's something we really need to work on. And in my groups, it's something we want to focus on. Um, on one hand, exactly what you're telling about surveys before, after, after some time, um, as well as using um, source code mining uh, repository mining uh, techniques and stuff to figure out how it changes and to get some proof that this stuff works because until now all we have is like feedback we get so we of course we um, so my group also consults <coughs> so kind of consults group so we help out we help them introduce processes and tools and when you talk to people it really changed their perception of um, developing code. At the beginning when you talk to them, it's a nasty task they are annoyed to do because it all the time breaks and they all the time have to find the box and it's really annoying. But um, when you talk to them afterwards, they're quite happy with the process. Even if they, in between, often say, oh, there's so much overhead, so much stuff I have to learn. Afterwards, they're like, no, this is structured and I have the feeling I can change something in my code without being totally afraid that it would screw up everything. And um, one thing I try to measure, at least in a, not in a, that I they have really survey, also I'm like, I look how often they publish um, the results, or meaning not, but, but um, like they have versions uh, of their code. Because before, when I come to a project, it's one of the first questions I ask is one, like, from when is your last version you're working with officially? Mm -hmm. And often the answer is like a year old. and like, are you developing? Yes, but because of this feature and that feature, we don't have something which you can run currently. And afterwards, when I see they get a new version out every three or four months, I know there has an increase and this got better and the people are just happier if you talk to them and about the software development and they are proud and not trying to hide it anymore. But yeah, we try to find a way to get this into numbers. That's a big <laughs> next task which is up in front of us. Yeah, so does anyone in the audience have, have good examples of this? Because I think one of the challenges is we're trying to basically get money to do this because we think it's the right thing. Money pays for people that allows us to go out and help. Um, but to get money past a certain stage, you know, people are willing to give you money to start with, but after that, they're looking for some sort of proof and evidence. And often that isn't, unfortunately, scientific evidence. So it's not necessarily the scientific papers that go at this practice is the right one. It's the hard evidence that you're helping people that they're paying money for. So, and did you have your hand up? I can't offer, I've got the mic now. Uh, as I was say, I, I can't offer a, a good example. I think I can only offer another question. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, so, I'm uh, understanding correctly, I think a lot of you have spoken about things that a lot of us know about why you should do things as we would say correctly, or, or why well, you should use version control as, as an example. Um, but I, I, I think in a, in a lot of cases, it's, it's a, a stronger argument that I feel I need to make is almost why what someone is currently doing is not okay. Because in practice for them, it is. Um, there, I have colleagues that do fantastically well in their careers, that continue to do fantastically well uh, at various stages, and uh, I have no idea what version control is, and um, no matter how much I can tell them how important something is, how much better it is, they, they fundamentally don't need to do it. Yeah, so that's a good question. How do you go past the early adopters? Um, so I perhaps have an answer for that, because um, for us, we created um, a set of guidelines, software engineering guidelines, and why there are recommendations in their single things you need to do, we got to the point where they become part of the quality management um, recommendations which we have, guidelines which we have at DLR. Meaning there's every year an audit where they get asked if they know about these guidelines and if they are using it. 
and they don't have to use it. They can give you an argument. If they have a good reason not to, it's fine. But they at least have to have thought about that. And that's a good first step how we got over the early adopters because we kind of made it required without giving exactly introduction what exactly needs to be done, but at least to deal with software engineering. So just saying, I don't care because it's not a problem for me is not an answer anymore, it's not valid. Um, because the auditors will tell you then, but there's people coming and going all the time, people have to work with legacy code all the time, which is quite regular for us. So um, this is, we, we got around this this way. So there we went from the top to bottom approach. And this worked very well. Um, so going back to your point about uh, sorry, <laughs> um, academics who have a fantastic career and yet don't know what uh, version control is, uh, to some extent it doesn't matter for them. I mean, so they're fantastic academics, but uh, and so when they retire, they've left behind them a legacy of papers. But they haven't left behind them a legacy of useful code. So they're not as good as they could be. So, so even if they don't need it, um, it's, it's still limiting them. Um, but the other thing is, it's, it's not really always those academics we're, we're talking to. Um, and actually, a lot of the people that don't have, uh, that don't use good software standards sort of know it. And they and they they kind of know it's a, a problem, um, and the reason they kind of don't uh, get help for that is they kind of they, they don't know where to turn for training. So, so I, I kind of think that's a sort of more important um, point. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Alison and Dan reply and then. Yeah. Go back there. That's okay. Yeah, I mean it can be a bit of a problem that. Sometimes the, the person, the people that get helped by this may not be just the individual who has to make a change. So sometimes it's a case of what is the culture in your organisation or in your group in terms of, you know, how do people get required to do things that they don't necessarily want to do and how far down that route do you want to go? You know, a lot of people, like you say, once they have had help and once they have been able to try these things, they really want to do it. And, is that in the future going to be enough of a pool of people that we can, cause you can you can waste sort of huge amounts of energy on the sort of ever diminishing returns of chasing the last few very resistant people and is that a route we want to go down and to some extent that depends what they're doing, what they're responsible <coughs> for, what the impact on your organisation is if they don't adopt it, you know, maybe if they are responsible for some very critical piece of infrastructure, that is part of their job and at some point they will have to be sort of required to do some things. But, uh, I think in terms of um, if there are, a whole, normally we have such limited resources that we can get a lot more out of pursuing the people who are sort of willing but are not, unable than chasing those last few. Yeah, I was going to say that for us, I think we, uh, we try not to have projects where, where there's one person that's responsible for something, but things are more shared in terms of responsibility. And when you do that, it's very hard to have somebody that's using different engineering practices than the other person that's working with, with them. And so then you have to come to some agreement. And often the agreement is a good agreement in, for, I think, in terms of software engineering, because that's actually what works better for teams. So maybe you just... What you're, I think what you're saying works fine for one person, but it's very hard to have that work for a team of six people. So what you're sort of saying is everyone should, all researchers should really work in groups of three people. <laughs> okay, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, uh, we also have kind of currently the situation of change that there's more and more or the, the first journals of um, conferences start um, to require you to hand in even your code and yeah. other things. Meaning um, you have, I mean, you still don't have to have not necessarily version control or something, you have to hand in your code. but other people would see it, so it's starting, or there's uh, other journals where you have to have your code on GitHub, or same is for some um, <coughs> projects, like Horizon projects or something, where you get money, but just with um, under the condition that your code will be open source and will met some standards. And I think this is something where no researcher who wants to be successful comes around in the long run. It's something which is slowly changing, and perhaps 
Yeah, you could say a bit late, but better now than never. And uh, we just have, uh, everybody has to work towards this change and um, really, if enough people say this is important because we reproducible science and stuff, so this is topics which are coming up and become more and more important. If all of this goes on the way it's starting now, um, yeah, this, this <coughs> will just be not a possibility for researchers anymore in the long time. The wrong one to, to just say I'm not doing it because yeah, then there won't be a successful research anymore. Yeah. Can I get a quick show of hands? Um, who in the room would like to, s to help their organization um, help people adopt better software engineering practices? Right, I'm now, <laughs> I'm now looking for anybody who didn't put up, anyone not put up your hand? Okay, <laughs> interesting. So, uh, so we're obviously in the right room here. So I guess the question um, I have is, both for the panel and both for the audience, and the audience as well, is um, what one thing would you like people in this room to do? Because clearly we are all keen on getting these practices adopted. What one thing would you ask them to do in the next year? that would help them um, do this? So I think just going back to what I said at the beginning, I don't think it's, I think we don't know, or we haven't at least documented clearly enough what the minimal best practices are or what the minimal good enough practices are. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like we have to start with knowing what we want people to do before we can start telling them what <coughs> they should do. Okay. Okay, so I'll tell them what they should do. <laughs> no. um, so one idea I think that um, quite a lot of people are thinking about at the moment is the idea of kind of internal local community of practice and um, research software communities. So I might suggest either starting something along those lines or joining something local along those lines and contributing to providing that kind of on the ground peer support where people can help each other adopt practices. Yeah, I was going to say exactly the same thing. So we started up a research software network at Nottingham last year, and it's just sort of people encouraging each other to to do better, yeah. if you like. Um, and so we we had someone who did a talk about the open source project that he runs, and he did the whole range of different practices, and people sort of picked up on the two things that they picked up on were version control and testing, and they're just really keen to learn. So. Yeah, I think such communities are really important, especially because suddenly there's a place where you get, um, where people see what you do and you get positive feedback that you're doing it. And this is something which is one of the problems which we have now. It's like, if people are doing this, nobody kind of cares because they don't get any um, positive things out of it. They get, a, they get a positive mark or something when they, they publish something, but about publishing open source code, nobody cares. But if you create a community where this is valued, um, people do this. So I would agree, create a community and let them, let, give them perhaps even some, some um, basics to work with and then see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I agree. I think there is an issue that there is a, the, the community of kind of supportive RSEs where we all know what we're going for is not necessarily the same as the community of um, code developers yeah. that we're working with. So I think actually what we're kind of arguing for is leadership. We we're sort of saying, oh, we're, you know, we're going back to what Kirsty said, you know, we, we kind of have this distributed idea of um, people who kind of know what they want and they're kind of going out into their different communities to, to try and achieve that. Okay, any thoughts from the audience? What, what would you like people to do? Um, so, something we've been doing in Manchester, and I don't think we're alone at all, actually. I think there's plenty of people doing this all, all around the world. <coughs> um, but we, we try and lead by example in the sense that when someone comes to us and says, I've got this problem with my code, can you help me? Um, before we do anything to help them, we load it into GitHub, if it's not in GitHub, so that we have somewhere to start from. And then if we're going to be messing around with their code, um, we put some tests in if there aren't any tests. Um, so that we know we haven't broken their code and we may be just optimising it. And then we ask them if they know about Git and if they say no, then we say, well, we have some Git uh, training, please come along. And then when we finish the work on the code, we give them the link to the GitHub 
So we've we've taken their code, we've we've done the improvements, and we've given them back a a, um, a version controlled, tested version of the code, and we've trained them to use GitHub. So that's a practical thing that we do. Just while that's moving, can, can I suggest that would be a great blog? Yeah. <laughs> I'll find some time. <laughs> 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 So I think uh, one thing that is lacking uh, in, uh, uh, in this is that we don't yet know how to measure the impact of, uh, of what we are doing. And this relates to the question that you were asking as to you know, how do we know we are doing the right thing. And the reason people don't want to change is unless they are burnt, they have no incentive to change. Now measuring impact is hard. and and the people in the room probably are the best set of people to start thinking about this because once we measure the impact, convincing people, scientists who to rely on metrics might become easier. Yeah, and I've often thought that one of the, the key things that we could do as a group, because we have the access to these kind of powers, is to uh, persuade our university IT services to do a remote wipe of everyone's laptops. Um, as an instigator of change. But I've been told this is a really bad idea. So. <laughs> One small thought is, whilst it's anecdotal, if we share stories about why it can be really, really, really useful, I mean, like, close to your remote wiping everyone's laptop, for example, share the story of the laptop that had your thesis on that got stolen, but it was on GitHub but choose a different variety of stories that touch different types of researchers so that they feel it personally why it's important to them. Thank you. Other things from the audience? Um, does anyone have a question for our panel? Given that we have here the heads and, uh, of, of a, lot of, a lot of groups that have been doing this work for a long time. So, yeah. From another head. So, so one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, which um, good practices from you know so software engineering in general kind of work and don't work in the research context. So, have you come across something that you've tried to bring over and have decided actually in, in the research context this doesn't work? In, in any sort of way? Uh, so, a few of us wrote a blog post about something very close to along these lines from the Wussy workshop, actually. Um, and I think we, we were in that same discussion, and one of the things, I, I'm not saying it would never work, but um, I think there's a lot of um, principles from agile development that can work, but sometimes trying to wholesale adopt something like Scrum from a software engineering teams might apply, that can be very problematic, because <laughs> it's very rare that you've got all the prerequisites in place with the team that might be developing your software for that to work, the idea that you've got, uh, you know, maybe four to seven people working on the same bit of software, you know, and that the, the customer can become part of the team and that they're kind of interchangeable to work on different tasks. It's so rarely the case in research software. So you really kind of, sometimes you have to go back to the principles underneath the practices and say, um, a lot of what you're trying to achieve with agile development, yes, we want, you know, quicker iterations and more feedback and this kind of thing and more communication, but the letter of the process may not work. Uh, another experience I had with um, is with with tools sometimes. So, um, for example, we, we currently still use we're doing the last phase of using SVN and Mantis, and Mantis is really ugly. So it's really hard to convince people to use it. And sometimes when they are happy with their Excel spreadsheets and they work for them to have their to dos in, so I don't try to convince them to use Mantis because it was just so. It's just too much to, to what you have to put in or stuff. So uh, in generally, I try to find the appropriate tool, not the best tool I think of there for their tool, uh, for their task, but the tool they are most comfortable with. And sometimes it means to go with Excel, which I really hate. So um, this is what I learned was that it's not always the best tool, which as a computer science you would expect, but it's really what they need and what's the best tool for this group. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes you can have one group, a set of tools, and they're happy, and the other one just can't work with it because it just doesn't match their personality. 
And um, this is also something which we experienced when we wanted to, to change from SVR, so we change to GitHub and we um, do throw mantas away and get a Jira or something. And so we asked, like, what, what's the most important for a new tool, what you want? Because we wanted to have something which would cover all the use cases and all the um, tasks they had to address. And all we got, or what we got most was, it has to be one site where everything is. It has to be one click and we will have everything. We asked everything, yeah, issue tracking, uh, the wiki, um, the repository, I want to see my code there, I want to even commit there. So in the end, they wanted to have a source for it, uh, some case. So we went to GitLab in the end. But as a computer scientist, I would never have picked that first solution because I said it's, it's not covering the needs of everybody. But they were like, oh, I can work around that. Most important, I just have to remember one URL. <laughs> and this was like really the most important fact for them. And that it's just one click. They don't have to apply somewhere to get an SBN or something to send a mail. It has to be one click they have to enter. It has to be there instantly. And this was more important than all the features in there. They didn't care for so much. Um, yeah, and this was a big learning for me and a real change in how, so we threw all away all our plans and, and <laughs> went with GitLab and made a complete new plan. So um, yeah, it's like, don't stick with your plans just because you're computer scientists, because you don't really know what, how the scientists might work, which can be really different from how you work. Actually talk to your list your users. <laughs> I guess just to maybe combine the, both of those answers a little bit and slightly, for something slightly different, um, when there have been a couple of new projects that I've started on where we decided how we were going to do things and all the great tools that we're going to use, and after a month or two we had given up on a number of the tools that would have been good to use in some ways, but they just weren't as high a priority as actually developing the code. Um, and so I think when you have limited resources, you have to make choices about what's the most important, and those might <coughs> not, for a particular project, those might not always be what a software engineer would tell you are the right things. Hey. Hi, uh, my question for the panel. You're all uh, kind of leaders of agents of change and <laughs> culture change and change of practice. So what in the last, and I think you touched on some of this, but what in the, uh, in the last 12 months has kind of surprised you as a kind of a roadblock or a problem which you thought uh, that's kind of caught you off guard? <laughs> this question. <laughs> Perhaps it's just another similar anecdote of things I couldn't get people to do. Um, but we, uh, we were trying to move away from SVM towards Git, um, and uh, the reason we couldn't convince anyone to do this was because they wanted a global version number for all commits. So that was a, a roadblock that surprised me. So I, I kind of hinted at this before, but I, I think one, one thing that we have changed very recently is that we no longer hire uh, so in, in the, the RC part of our organization, we no longer hire a single person to do a single job. Um, if there's uh, somebody that comes to us and they want uh, the equivalent of one person, we hire um, two people and give them half of each of those people. And we thought that that was going to be, um, we thought that was going to be a lot more problematic in terms of the people that were asking us for help, and it's turned out to be relatively acceptable, which surprised us. Yeah, because perhaps I have a positive example because um, in the last 12 months we had this um, that we got a so, so next to providing these guidelines and stuff, we also do consulting or whatever. So we go to the projects we have with their processes and everything. So there's a chance that this proper software at the end, the result, um, gets increased. And uh, so there was a project and they wanted to from a research project to become a product. So it was even the idea of becoming a startup or something, so there's a whole process in DLR to do so. And there's a whole department taking care of um, that. And this department said they just get the funding to become a project if they get us on board, so that they have a real process and everything. And we were kind of surprised because we talked to these people like somewhere, but never this directly, and we never came up with the idea to make us a, re like a requirement in a project or something, but um, so we were directly written in this plan, like with, 
I don't know, six months of payment or something. And they said like, yeah, is this enough? Or it was just three months at the beginning, like, is this enough? And we're like, what's this project about? Nobody talked to us and we're in the plan and it's kind of everything was set, nobody, just nobody talked to us. Um, but it was a nice thing to see that somebody in this more or less marketing and PR and technology, we call it technology marketing or something, uh, department understood what, that what we do is important and that this is necessary and yeah, they couldn't produ uh, produce a software product without any help because there was no, no computer scientist in this team. And this was a surprise in, for us in the change which is happening, obviously, in other departments which are not, you know, computer scientists are there at all. They just realize how important this got. So that's nice. Okay. Alison. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I was also thinking we have a, a project where we have a bunch of engineering graduate students who have written tools in MATLAB, and we're trying to get them to put them into a science gateway or a VRE. Um, and it's been remarkable to me that even though their advisors are very happy with MATLAB and don't really want them to change, um, the students themselves have been very receptive to rewriting their code in Python and putting it in Jupyter Notebooks, which is, turns out to make it much easier to put it into them. Um, into the environment, and along the way as they're doing this, they also start putting it into uh, GitHub. And so it's, even though this is not what their advisors are asking them to do, they found it that it really works, and they, they, they've really been surprised at how receptive they've been doing this. Ah, so, so I've got one block to, to something we were trying to do. Um, whether or not it surprised me, <laughs> I couldn't say. But um, we've had some success in sort of um, at least establishing how people can go about getting permission to make their code open source and for sort of a very, very long running experiment that's, you know, a lot of legacy code, this, this has been quite a big thing. But one thing that really blocked that was the fact that a lot of code that's existed for a very long time has been developed uh, piecemeal by lots of different people under lots of different budget codes and effectively had this such a complicated web of who might own the copyright to this thing that is kind of practically speaking been impossible to to unpick enough to, to get a license agreed. So it's kind of a lesson for the future. You know, on our, on our list of things to think about before you start is, you know, to clarify those things, who's going to own this and who gets to make decisions. Okay. Last word. <laughs> on, on, on anything. <laughs> so um, so uh, I think uh, if there is nothing more to say on this topic, uh, I, I'd like to, to thank all of the panelists um, for their insights. I'd like to thank you as the audience for, um, for, for providing your own knowledge and experience. And I think the thing to take away here is perhaps that last thing that Dan mentioned is that there does seem to be a generational shift happening. So, uh, you know, as Kirsty said, we are, we are the leaders of today, not tomorrow. And there is a generation that we should be helping right now. So uh, let's go out and do that. Thank you very much. <laughs>